nation who forgets its defenders itself shall be forgotten. Within five minutes, all hell broke loose. What kept me alive was the mercy of God. And there was a lot of bloodshed and a lot of wounded soldiers that day. We didn't know which one of us was going to die next. The bodies were laying there and uh, we wanted to get them back. And everybody that's caught in their circle, they're going to kill. So kill as many as you can. Back in the 50s, it was like, when my son grows up, he's going to the military, he's gonna, he's gonna be somebody. Quit school and joined the Army so I could be a paratrooper. <laughs> and I said, well, that sounds pretty cool. You get actually $55 a month. I said, well, hell, I'll do that. I was tired of being a kid. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. And there's no amount of money in this world that could have bought that adventure for me. Well, I was standing on the corner one night there was no one there but me. It was cold. I thought, this is crazy. I'm going home. I went home, and I sort of made up my mind then it was time to join the Army. Uh, I'll be darned if I was going to read about in a book later to see what happened. That was one reason. So I went home, and I told my mother, I said, uh, I joined the Army. She started crying. What did you sign up for? And I said, Airborne. She started crying again. What, do you get, what, what job? I said, Airborne Infantry, and she started crying even louder. She says, when do you leave? And I said, tomorrow. And she started crying even louder. So uh, the next day I was on my way. We were good, we were proud, we were proud. 
Jesse Salcedo. I was born in St. Joseph, Missouri. I went to a tough high school, uh, learned how to fight in high school, and I was a Golden Glove boxer in the Missouri and Kansas Golden Gloves. I enjoyed boxing. When I was in school, I couldn't get anybody to fight me, and there were plenty of them out there in the Golden Gloves. When I got out of high school, I, I joined the service. I didn't go to Vietnam for patriotic reasons. It was a test. The mental and physical trials of climbing mountains and combat and living in the jungle. I remember when I was over there that I was going through hell. I remember how terrible things were. I said, man, this is hell. But I volunteered for it, so I will get through it. Well, I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia, Fort Dix, New Jersey, jump school, Vietnam. My name is George Mink. I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was working. I wasn't crazy about the job. I had forgotten about college. When you're 19, you're invincible. You're not going to get killed. Every one of us went into harm's way to take care of our friends. I don't remember anyone who had ever seen their friends kill having any regrets about killing enemy soldiers. Except maybe there weren't enough of them. I shoved it all inside my rucksack. Every single thing they gave me, I shoved inside there. Some guy grabbed me before we went out patrol and said, man, you can't carry all that. You don't need all that. You don't need this, you don't that, you don't need this, you don't need that, you need more of this, there was ammo, <laughs> you don't need this, and he threw all kinds of stuff away, and he says, now you're ready to go. Vic Marciano, born in Bronx, New York, November 17th, 1948, Catholic school, uh, altar boy, um, played Little League. Summertime, there were always big picnics with the family, you know, pig roast and uh, things like that. I told my mother I was going to enlist in the service, and I needed her signature because I was 17. And she felt the need to call my father, and my father says, there's a war going on. And that was the first I heard of it. I didn't know there was a war going on. But at that time, you know, I said, wow, you know, can't be that bad of a war. I didn't know anything about it. arrived in Vietnam in late May, 1967. Oh, that first day off the plane was pretty scary, you know. And that heat hits you that first time, you hardly catch your breath. And you say, oh man, I'm not gonna be able to do this. This is terrible. The ride from Tung San Air Force Base, where we landed in Vietnam, up to Long Bend was a strange ride. Nothing clicks for me. I can't believe how naive sometimes I was. Somebody has to tell me somebody's liable to throw a grenade through the window, and that's why they're caged up. I said, oh, really, you know? <laughs> cool. And the smells, which I can't even describe, you know, things that I've never smelled before or since Vietnam. Certain smells that just immediately were burned into you. When I stepped off that commercial airliner in Bien Hoa, the, the fragrance of, of South Vietnam hit me. My name is Larry Speed, and uh, I was born in Des Moines, Iowa. I attended Valley High School, graduating in 1964, and uh, had a motorcycle, had the, the toys that uh, the other guys had. I, I didn't know how serious Vietnam was. My mother and dad took me to the airport. And it was, uh, it wasn't pleasant. 
I, I think I have one photo that I took when I left the airport. And, and my dad was proud of me being in the, the uh, service and being airborne, but uh, he had the saddest look on his face. day that I arrived in Vietnam, I had a, a friend take a picture of me in the 70th replacement center. I was so proud because I was loaded down with my rucksack and holding an M16, and it was a good picture. And I looked like a little boy. I think I probably had a little bit of anxiety then. It hadn't uh, registered with me yet what Vietnam was all about. That wouldn't register until my uh, very first combat experience. His eyes are the same, his voice is the same, and he speaks exactly the same way as he did then. Well, you know, you know my voice, right? And has kind of talk slow, right? I was tall, and all you had to do is erase a B and put an L. And that, that made lurch. Some of them spelled it L-E-A-R-C-H. Ernest Benton Birch. I was born in Southern Maryland, and I lived on a farm. Two older sisters and a younger brother all in five years. My brother and I were a uh, year apart, so we were best of friends. I was in uh, Fort Bragg, been there I don't know how long, and a little bit of trouble. And I thought if I took that little short, that they would forget about things and I'd be out of sight, out of mind. So I took a short for Vietnam. You know, it's just like a family. They were doing a job that you were trained to do. I didn't have a wife, didn't have kids. No reason to be scared. The 173rd Airborne Brigade. 173rd. 173rd Airborne. In jump school, I heard about the 173rd. They went in there in 1965. They had a great reputation for being the best the 173rd were volunteers. We went out there and volunteered to put our life on the line. I had an older brother while well, he was airborne. That was a tradition that I wanted to follow. I wanted to uh, um, be like my brother. Always looked up to him. I knew very little about the 173rd. Like I said, there was a couple guys that came back, you know, and I saw the patches of the 173rd. Still didn't know anything about their history or anything about the unit itself. It wasn't until I finally got with the 173rd that uh, I realized what a great unit they were. I'm proud I served with these great men that are, that are here today and the ones that died. I was a paratrooper. Recon platoon. Recon. 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 At the time, I thought that was kind of a neat sounding uh, term, recon. When I extended, I said I wanted to go to recon platoon. We uh, spent our days on search and destroy operations. Anything that the enemy could use, we would destroy. They had uh, uh, a recon patch over the airborne patch and the 173rd patch and they already had a reputation. They were very proud and very good at what they did. I figured that they were elite, even more than the regular airborne soldier. 
right at the time I was graduating from jump school, the 173rd was moving into Doc Toe, and they were having so many casualties that they had to be reinforced. They had to be replaced. Charles Spencer, they call me Chuck. I don't know, I was young and crazy, and it, it didn't bother me that much. I was 18, I turned 19 in December after I got there. And I ended up turning 19, 20, and 21. Spent three birthdays in London altogether. Before it was over, I was uh, an acting platoon leader for a while, acting platoon sergeant for a while, and a squad leader. I had missed most of the real heavy stuff in Doc Ho. 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 D-A-T-O. The Battle of Doc Ho was, was, uh, extremely intense. It was more than 30 some days of fighting. It was constant fighting. Firefights before were very small compared to, to taking on the North Vietnamese in full force and fighting an enemy that was very good and very brave. The day of um, November 11th of 67, it was just uh, an accident waiting to happen. The NVA were entrenched on these hills. And we'd had contact with them the days prior to this. There were smaller skirmishes. Uh, we, we found bodies and we found where 500 pound bombs had struck. It was a terrible firefight because I don't even remember the details. But I remember the aftermath. And the aftermath was that six recon guys were killed and three bodies were missing. The captain at the time was determined to say, we will find the bodies, we'll not leave here. And I think we searched for three days for the bodies. I counted 142 bodies that day of North Vietnamese. And I counted them over and over and over again all day long, looking for one more body to try to make up for my six recon friends. Pumped up 875 on the last day, and uh, that's where they were bringing us in Thanksgiving dinner. And this is a terrible day, the one that sticks in my mind, in Jesse's mind, and a lot of other guys' minds, too. The bodies were still up on 875. As they brought in the hot food for us, we had to load the bodies onto the Chinooks take them out of there where they set the hot food line up and then we were supposed to go eat our Thanksgiving dinner. That was near impossible to do because we're talking a hundred bodies in body bags and some not in body bags that need to be put in body bags to uh, put them on helicopters to, to remove them from that area. And that wasn't, uh, that's the most dead people I've ever seen at one time, and I don't ever want to see that again. Who wins the battle, you know? Is by how many's dead or by taking the hill? I felt very bad. It was very difficult for me to see so many Americans dead, because I've never seen so many Americans dead before. I remember the stink of the um, bodies. I remember stuff like that, yeah. I remember the Hueys, and they would be uh, full of dead bodies in body bags, and they were bringing them to our hill, and there would be one body bag swaying under the chopper on a, on a uh, uh, rope. And, and you could see that in the distance and that and the, the chopper was flying even and at a steady pace and this this body bag was swaying back and forth like that just a little bit. I thought to myself, there's another family that doesn't know that their son has been killed in Vietnam yet. Recon 
and then they took 15 guys from each uh, rifle company, and then I think a few rear echelon other guys, and say all the misfits they could find, and they formed Delta Company. Delta Company. Delta Company. Delta Company. Delta Company. In September of 67. We were still in recon platoon, and we came back from a, an overnight patrol. When we went out, there wasn't a Delta Company. When we came back, there wasn't a recon platoon. The first thing they did was put recon platoon into Delta Company. So Tom has only impressed me as somebody brave and eager. It intrigued me. Now I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm, now I'm going to learn how to kill people. Terrence Lee Joseph Tomazoli. <laughs> and I'm from uh, Nokomis, Illinois. I was a third generation coal miner. My grandfather and my father both died of black lung. I wasn't doing very well in school, but I was going to become a senior, and I said, nah, you know what, I, I got better things to do. I got to go fight a war, because I volunteered. I said, I want to be airborne infantry, and I want to go fight the war in Vietnam. They said, well, all right, come on in. So that's how it started. The chances of us surviving is uh, not good. The infantry has to go out and kill the enemy, so your chances are probably 50-50. That's not very good. Lieutenant Jones landed in the jungle and, uh, with Delta Company, and Terry Jones became first platoon leader. He graduated at the top of the class, and so now he's going to lead a whole platoon of men. Bottom line was my country was at war. You know, there was Americans over there on the ground getting killed. That time is not the time to debate, in my opinion, the, the reason why. I'm Terry Jones. I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, I wrestled four years in high school. I went to the uh, University of Missouri at Rolla. Uh, it's an engineering school. I had a student deferment where I didn't have to go in, in the Army or in the service. But at, uh, at that time, the Vietnam War was heating up. Uh, I was brought up to believe that I was not better than anybody else. If I didn't go, there'd be somebody else over there. So I didn't see why I should not go. So uh, being a young man, I, I volunteered. I came in and took over this platoon uh, right around the 1st, 2nd of December. The guys that were there at all just survived the big battles up in Dock Toe. Uh, I've been through a lot of lieutenants by then. He was smart. He was smart enough to, to listen to the old guys. I had 1st Platoon, and 1st Platoon, when they formed Delta Company, they, took, they had a, what they call a recon platoon, and then they took them and made them 1st Platoon. And these guys all knew what they were doing, and uh, I was very, very impressed. And he, he asked for my advice on something. Should we take a trail or should we cut through the jungle? For a few minutes, I would feel the pressure of what it was like when you're responsible for 30 or 40 men. Oh, Jonesy was an ace. Tom Azzoli came out with them. They were the two new guys together. Two new guys you can take care of. If they sent us a squad of new guys, that would have been a serious problem because you can't take care of that many people at once. They uh, give me supplies and uh, 
rucksack and everything, you know, and an M16 and th threw me on a helicopter. And I went out to the company. The jungle was a very horrible place to live in. Fucking hot and you're sweaty, you have fucking leeches, clothes are dirty, you don't get a bath, your hair is matted together, you're sweating all the time, you're stinking, you get lousy food. The terrain, the, the snakes, the cold, icy ground. And the food is terrible, you know. The sea rations suck and half the time, you know. The sea rations they sent you out were all the bad ones. The assholes in the rear were stealing the good shit. The only thing that made you feel better was a uh, care package from home. You know, mom sent you some Kool-Aid and cookies or a cake. You take the Kool-Aid, throw it in your canteen to kind of kill the taste of that nasty ass water. FNG. Fucking new guy. I didn't know squat. I wasn't prepared for this. That was a fucking new guy. Very green lieutenant. Whenever the, the shooting would start, everybody would look at me. What do you want us to do? And that was from, from square to one. It's a different world when you're brand new. You're just scared. It took me three or four firefights before I could function, before I could see the enemy, think about what I'm doing. We'd shoot back, but we didn't know what we were shooting at. All I know is these guys were there. They had dirty, nasty-looking boots and dirty, nasty-looking fatigues, and everything I had was nice and shiny. I looked at them as, if they're dirty and nasty, then they must have been here for a while. If they're green and shiny, then they must have just got here. Nobody warms up to anybody right away and says, hey, welcome to the club. It takes a couple days for them to see, you know, whether you got your stuff together, you know, whether you know, you're going to be some babbling idiot. It was my first experience with combat. And it scared me. I made it to the wounded soldier. I just had a handful of dressings and bandages, and I realized then I didn't have enough. It was just overwhelming. I said, can we move him out of here? And about that time, there were some enemy rounds that rang out, pretty much answered my question. First actual firefight, a mortar attack uh, early in the morning, trying to shave. And all of a sudden, I heard the thumps, and somebody yells incoming. And I remember freezing at first, you know, like, it was the first time I had heard this incoming. But it was enough to open my eyes to the fact that there are people out there trying to kill us. There's somebody out there that wants to kill you. And he's going to do his best to get the job done. That changes your whole perspective about everything. Depending on what unit you were in, if you were there a month, you were an old guy. Everybody that came in to the brigade in the end of October was an old guy by the end of November, if they were still alive. Lurch had been there for a couple of years. You know, he'd been there since 65. The first firefight. Yeah, I knew I was getting shot at, but it didn't, didn't really scare me. Like a building block of the 173rd, he was always there. Ernest Birch, we called him Lurch. It's just like a story. It's 
you know, it just, it was happening, but you just didn't think it was happening. It was 1967 when I got there, so he was already there two years. Two years in the 173rd Airborne on the line. Just an amazing thing because of all the combat the 173rd was in. Have you ran into someone who spent three years in Saigon or Da Nang or Cameron Bay in exotic tour of duty? That's all they had. Lurch was in the jungle all the time. I liked the excitement. I liked the adrenaline rush. The guy was a soldier, and uh, he mentored a lot of soldiers, a lot of young soldiers. You learn from the leaders. Jesse Salcedo and Lurch were the old guys. People felt safe, felt like um, I could get them through or something. Maybe it's just that they saw I had a lot of time in Vietnam. But then it registered. Then I knew what it was all about, even though I was still green. Making contact with the enemy. VC and VA. In Ohio, we rabbit hunted a lot. It was the same thing, except these rabbits had a rifle. Because they were going to kill me, I would have to kill them. Just like you going deer hunting. What was nice, they were shooting back. Find, engage, and kill the enemy. That was our, we're not gonna find them if we don't uh, get out and look for them. That, that was our purpose. Here you have to pull back, then you pull back. You hear you have to move forward, you move forward. You hear you got the flank, you flank. You continue to fire, you look for the enemy, and, and you just do the best you can. Check that mountaintop right there on the map. Kill them. Okay, kill all them. Mark it on the map, we killed so many. Next day, We'll try that other mountain. Kill them too. Go over there and kill all them. Kill them all. People would say afterwards, how can you kill somebody? And I said, well, if you see your friends that were people a couple minutes ago, and now they're not anything more than a piece of meat laying in the jungle, it gets very easy to kill somebody. You want to get even for the people that killed your friends. Sal, he, he was talented with a machine gun. When the machine gun started firing, the enemy would put their head down. It was an extremely powerful weapon. He was a heavyweight Golden Glove champion, Kansas City. One member of his machine gun team went out in the middle of the night to drain his kidneys, and he did it right on Jesse. You're in the middle of the jungle, and everything's quiet except for the jungle sounds. Then you hear this string of profanity that would make a drill sergeant blush. That's when Jesse realized what was happening to him. Combat, I was determined to be the longest lasting machine gunner in my company. I had four people on a team instead of three. I shot six round bursts, the other three men would open up with an M16 and there would always be automatic fire going on. The enemy didn't have time to shoot at me and try to kill me. So I see this the best machine gunner I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of them. Never saw anybody any braver than him. Tom Azzoli was with me. The North Vietnamese were out in front of us like this, walking through the forest. We could see them. They were easy to see. I mean, they were easy to kill that day. I yelled for ammunition and nobody would move, not even my gun team. And Tom Azzoli got up, 
and ran outside the perimeter. Under fire, he came back with two, two boxes of ammunition, 200 rounds each. I could hear bullets ping, 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 and I'm in a clearing. Who can't, who can't pick me off, right? To me, it looked like he did a somersault, did a tumble. He said he tripped. You know, flipped through the air and feeding Jesse the ammo belt, running off a burst of incredible firepower, mowing everything down. While Tomazzoli was gone, I was out of ammunition. When I took the M79 grenade launcher, I started shooting M79s. Then I took out my 45 and started shooting and laughing. I did it to raise the morale. He saved us. They must have thought that they ran into a big number of Americans, so they backed off. They made a bad mistake that day, and they paid for it. They just left their dead and split. My imagination was so good that I could visualize death, a shadow of me next to me, a soldier. And I could look out in the corner of my eye and he would be there and be my companion, my friend. Try to understand not being afraid of death. I mean, if you overcome the fear of death, everything else is easy. I'd heard later that on March 3rd, after he was reinforced with a machine gun from another company, they got in an argument over who was gonna back out and who was gonna stay there. So I was shot in the right arm, couldn't fire the machine gun, was firing a picked up M16 with his left hand and told the other guy, you're shorter than I am, go. That's how Cedar. I was trained in communication, not infantry. And when I went there, I knew everything. I knew all the tactics. I knew uh, what the enemy was going to do. I knew everything. I was walking through the jungle, and this voice came to my head. That you've been in a thousand wars. This is your last war. And I looked down at my feet, and I saw sandals. And I looked to both sides of me, and I saw soldiers with spears and swords. I went home, and I found that those visions that I saw were actually Roman legions, the way they looked about 2,000 years ago. I know it was my last war. Kofran was killed March 19th. Lieutenant Farrah. Holmes, Brown, Nakadil, Ducker, Latman. Don Latman was right there in the CP group. You know, we were very close. On his helmet, he wrote, Machine Gun Made. Fire team leader, Sergeant Torres, was killed. Tom Ramey, Tommy Pope, Larry Sane, John Gunther, Henry Chester, Harry Ellis, Ernie Young. And then Ernie Madrid. Staff Sergeant Ronald Ducker, he just wanted to come back. Well, 
Lieutenant Serum was killed at the Cobra's platoon. March 15th, uh, John Gunther, Henry Chester, Harry Ellis, Ernie Young, Tommy Pope, and Patrick Lucero. Uh, some of these guys were the new guys. They haven't even been in the jungle a couple weeks. And a sniper got them. Cofran, Tom Ramey, Merchant, and Tommy Mabe killed March 19th. Lieutenant Fair, he jumped over the log to go behind a tree. He got shot about on, um, I guess it was probably five or six feet away from me. When he got killed, it's like losing the sun. I was asked to go on point. I didn't feel comfortable, you know. I kind of was still in R&R &R mode. And that's where my head was. My head was not on the trail. It's the Ernie Madrid said, the heat take point. Ernie and I were tight. We were best friends. Ernie was part Navajo and part Mexican. He used to say to me every morning, and I'd see him, yet the head day. Which he told me meant, hello, my friend. And, uh, I'm it. So anyways, we moved out of patrol. Ernie took point. The firefight broke out. Towards the left side, it, um, and Ford was where Ernie was. And the last thing I heard him say was, you know, LT, I can see him. They're just beyond this um, little embankment there. I can toss a grenade in there, and I heard the LT tell him to toss the grenade. Uh, he tossed the grenade, but it must apparently stepped out from behind a tree, and when he did, he caught a full burst in the chest, and he was dead instantly. After March 3rd, Learning the fact that your best friend had been killed, two, three, four, five of your best friends are now dead, that changed my whole life. And now, there's a number. Today, is it your day? Another day goes by. Today is your day? Nope. Another day, another day, you never knew. You just never knew. I have no qualms in killing those who are trying to kill me or kill my friends. As ugly and grotesque as it may sound, that's war. You deal with it and you go on and you survive or you die. He's dead, it don't mean nothing. Put him in a poncho liner. Carry him up the hills, call a chopper, get him out of here. If you dwell on it, you're going to be the next man in the poncho line. Don't mean nothing. A lot of guys just say that. Staff Sergeant Ronald Ducker. He probably taught me more in three months than the Army did in three years. I ended up taking his place, and uh, that was hard. Kenny Boss, uh, an extendee, I mean, had his time in and extended uh, from California, young buck sergeant. He really knew his shit, he was a good man. Carl Merchant was tall, skinny. Uh, Jewish kid from New York. He looked less like you'd picture an airborne paratrooper looking. And he was a hell of a paratrooper. He was a good man. He knew his job. He, he knew his stuff. He wasn't afraid. If we got pulled in rear air to a fire support base or somewhere, the chaplain could come out. They would hold a, a 
memorial for the guys we had lost. Just like you see in the movies, the upright rifle and the empty paratroopers boots and they'd have a service for him. In the field, you did the best you could. They had the bodies on, on, a, on a LZ we cut out, and they didn't take the bodies out till the next day. They took the wounded out. It got dark, they left the bodies overnight, and the platoon, one, two at a time, would go up and pay respects. Everybody took a turn. I cried when I counted those 142 bodies and, and, and looked for my buddies for three days and did those things because we were, we were very, very close. And I, I did my morning then. We were actually in combat, like in, in a lull at night in, in the Battle of Darto and some of these other places. We could be talking to each other and talking, you know, really how much we love each other and how much we, we, would, we would die for each other and cry. And it was because of the great respect and the great regard and great love we had for each other. I'm sure everybody that's been in combat feels the same way about the people that were their uh, comrades in arms. They went through things together and survived that normal people couldn't fathom in the least. We all had jobs to do. And, and my job and the other medic's job was to take care of these guys. And their job was to take care of everyone else. Kenny buys. Kenny buys. Kenny buys. Kenny buys. Can he buys? Point man that was killed that day was Kenny Buys. Just a California surfer kid. Tan, very good looking. Kenny was one of the first guys that came up to me when I was new in country and said, hey, don't worry about this. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And uh, that's how I knew Kenny Buys. Kenny Baez is my best friend in Vietnam. Kenny Baez was a soldier's soldier. With him, Lurch, and Jesse Salcedo, they were the backbone, and all of a sudden he's gone. He was a sharp-looking soldier. When he put his gear on, he looked good. Everything was in place. Kenny Byers always carried a silver spoon in his pocket. Doc Speed had the silver spoon with blood on it. He said that belonged to Kenny Byers. It was just one of those things. Everybody knew Kenny had a, a silver spoon. And he always carried a, he always had a drive on rag. Uh, it's a triangular bandage that the medics carried. They're good for head wounds because of the way they're shaped. He was unique. He had a little style, had a little class to him. Bottom of that triangle is the tail. On this tail, it said buys. And it may have said K buys, I'm not sure, but it said buys. And so um, they were a hot commodity. So the medics were always asked, hey doc, you got a drive on rag? And uh, yeah, we had drive on rags. If you had to have a profile of a soldier in Vietnam, it would be Kenny Buys. There was nobody better than Vietnam walking point. Every time his fire team had point, he himself would walk point. He could put one of his men on it. To be on point, you gotta be pretty sharp. You have to listen. Point man was uh, the first man that was out on patrol or taking the platoon or the squad or the, the company through the, the jungle. Kenny Buys pulled point that day. On March 3rd. March 3rd. March 3rd. March 3rd. March 3rd. March 3rd. Of 68, 
I started recording the names of soldiers in D Company that were uh, killed, died of wounds, and wounded in action. I remember all of them. Ducker, Nakadil, Doc Latman, Brown, Byes. I never got over that. I never got over that day. It was a certainty that I was going to get killed or wounded that day. I didn't have a good feeling out that day. That day I was begging God to let me live through the day. Bad day. I had no idea where we were other than maybe we were in Kantun province. They took us out, dropped us on a hill. There was all this smoke that had settled from the artillery and the, the bombs. And as the helicopters came in, the rotors would swirl the smoke and the smoke would rise up. We dropped in a helicopter at a time and the helicopter was here and the hill was almost like a 45 degree angle. We had to jump off the helicopter. As soon as I touched the ground, I had a bad feeling. I immediately put the word out to everybody. I went to them face to face. Everybody I could do, I yelled at even. This place reminds me of Doc Toe. Be careful. First squad was going past me. And there were six of them that went past me. Nakadil, Ducker, Latman, Holmes, Brown, Kenny Bias. When I saw them, I knew that they were gonna die. Kenny Bice, find something, he'll report to me. Dog alert, found blood on the trail, I called the company commander. And uh, I got the same message, you know, continue on, continue on. So that's the message I give Kenny, drive on. The ridge line got very narrow. It fell down steeply on both sides, very steep. There was an intersecting trail. In fact, I believe it's on this map. Right here, the, the trail is still even on this map. And uh, Kenny, Kenny called me on the radio, looked like a, at least 100 men had used this trail, this intersecting trail, in the last 24 hours. I didn't see what was that important to go up and look, just look at this trail, and I said, I'll see it when I cross it, and told him to drive on. Well, uh, right after that, I heard an M16 open up, and I had the big Kenny. He was on top of him, and they waited for him. And there was uh, a lot of gunfire but there was a separation. Now I'd separated Captain Needham from his RTO. The RTO was to my, my left flank, and Captain Needham was to my right flank. And there was just a short distance between, I could have almost reached out and touched the RTO, but his radio was between us. There probably wasn't 36 inches separating the RTO and me, and the bamboo was was going like this, and the, the fire was right between us. I was too scared to be scared, but I thought, if it shifts one way or the other, the RTO is gonna get it, or I'm gonna get it. The firefight started and the bullets were coming in, so I started shooting a machine gun. When you get shot at, you fire back. But one of the bullets hit uh, Captain Needham, shot him in the leg. I still joke about it now. I said, when you see Needham, tell him that bullet was meant for me. So everybody in front of me, straight ahead, was hit. I ordered Jesse to crawl up to the point element. So I immediately took my machine gun and started going up front. Warmer, he was in a battle that I missed. And uh, he said I had to crawl over my buddy's bodies. 
and the thought went through my head, the thought only, I haven't done that. Brown and Holmes were two guys that stuck together like this all the time. And uh, uh, Brown was still alive and I saw his eyes and the last person he saw was me. And I crawled over both of their bodies. But anyway, I had a, what I consider a, a bad situation on my hand. I had these men in front of me, no contact, six men, uh, dead or wounded, didn't know. And my medic crawled past me. That was Don Lapman. On his own, before we even had any security up there, I called when we got firefighter, I call that security. Crawled all the way up to where Kenny Byes was. died on him. So we were engaged in this firefight for quite some time, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, we started getting uh, hit with some uh, uh, indirect fire. This other gun team, they were running back to the rear because of the mortars coming in. And I yelled at them to stop, and I, and I was an officer in the United States Army, you know, and they heard me, and they continued to go. And I thought about shooting them. I thought about doing it. Now that we're many years beyond it, I am tickled to death. No, I mean, I won't want to, no, I'm, I'm sick of death, I didn't do it, but back then, I'm talking about the way I was back then as a 21-year-old combat platoon leader. You know, this was the thoughts I had. So I came up with this plan, I told Ducker, I says, we'll throw smoke, a lot of smoke up there so they can't see you, we'll put a high volume of fire, and you drag them back. Told Jesse what was going on, he kept on the gun, you know, burst, 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 moving around. And I saw him in the smoke. I saw him pulling back the bodies. And uh, uh, so I was covering him with machine gun fire. And Mink, uh, was George Mink was one of them. You have to form a perimeter. And we would bring them back to the center of the perimeter. And we, whew, gee, I made six or eight trips. This was a lot of the old recon platoon we were bringing back dead. Fellas, I thought would never die. This sounds incredible, but this firefight took place probably at 35, 40 feet. They picked a place to fight, and they picked when to start the fight. And they waited. These guys waited till Bives was on top of them. That's where we ended up fighting. He saw something and opened up. That's when they opened up. I start going back up to see if anyone else was going to need help. And I ended up lying on the trail next to Lieutenant Jones. I was on his left side. Sergeant Ducker was kneeling on the right. Uh, we had our bodies back, there was nobody in front of me, so I got on the radio net and called in artillery. Uh, from the 4th Infantry Division, I called in on top of the hill and I walked it right down to us. When you say fire for effect, you get a barrage from the six guns. And uh, when I said fire for effect, a round came in awfully close to us. One of their uh, uh, guns was off that day. I went like this. That's what they train you to do. Cross your legs, excuse me, and you're on the ground. And you do that to protect your neck from any shrapnel. A round hit to the left of us, and it came in through my shoulder, which was raised a little bit on the ground, and it hit me in the hip. That's how much the shrapnel was coming across the ground. Anything that was just a little bit up got hit. George Mink was right on my left side, but again, this, this ridge line was so narrow, it started tapering immediately. He was just a little bit lower than me, and I got hit, he didn't. We had incoming rounds, and I just buried my face into the dirt. And Lieutenant Jones started screaming and squirming, and I looked around and saw a large hole in his back. Tremendous pain. I just had blood just gushing out of my mouth immediately. And um, I started squirming around the ground, I was trying to get away from the pain. And George grabbed me and said, Take it easy, Lieutenant. So 
so I scream for a medic and I start cutting the suspenders of his web gear off. I'm pulling out his uh, first aid bandage and patching him up. The medic got there, looked over to uh, our right and said, Sergeant Ducker, stay. Even though I expected to get around in the forehead crawling up that hill, the guys all around me were, were dead. This is what I actually thought. I thought somebody up there made a big mistake. I thought it was a mistake for me to get hit because I knew it probably would, it could possibly have been a fatal wound here. And I, I was shocked, surprised. It doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense because I expected to be killed crawling up there. And then uh, right away there was a medic there, um, I think his name was Santos, and uh, him and uh, Mink bandaged me up, propped me up against a tree, and uh, I was laying there, and, and after a while I noticed uh, a stinging down here. Why well, I got hit down here, and they hadn't, this wound was so bad that they hadn't noticed this other wound. That's where all this blood come from, was running down my leg. And there was another guy there in the perimeter to, you know, that was helping take care of the wounded, and I, I, I so told him he went to get dock speed. By now, I was somewhat seasoned in Vietnam because I'd been through Doc To. Now I carried a battle bag, and it was uh, an old C4 bag that they carried plastic explosives in. And in that bag, I had scissors, and I had battle dressings, I had battle bandages, and I had serum of albuum, and that's all. I didn't have any medicine. I didn't need any morphine at the time. I didn't need any penicillin. I didn't need any tetracycline. Uh, because he didn't use that in the battle. He used dressings and, and bandages and scissors. I remember him coming over and he looked at me and he goes, oh my God. And he had a gaping frag wound in his shoulder big enough for me to stick my hand in it. And I wrote him off for dead. And I thought that he would uh, surely die. I thought, what's your problem? I mean, what's, what's, why are you so shook up? You know, it's just a wound bandage. And I guess because I was bleeding to death. I prayed. Uh, I, I prayed for forgiveness of any and all sins I've ever done. That, that I did that immediately. Right after that, I got real calm and objective about my chances. I wasn't afraid of dying after that. I, I was kind of thinking, well, let's see. Uh, we're relieved by Charlie Company now. You know, we can get back to the perimeter, you know, if we can. You know, the helicopters are pretty fast. I wasn't scared at all of dying after I was hit. I ended up on the trail, the last place I wanted to be because that's where everybody was getting killed. And I was thinking, oh man, I'm on the trail. And I tried to get off of the trail. And the jungle was like a wall, it was solid. And I couldn't even do it, I couldn't even lean on the side, I couldn't do anything. So I made a decision to be on my knees and to fire with my machine gun. And nurse said, there's two right there and there was a bush in front of me. And I thought I shot where he was pointing, but he said, you missed. And a few seconds afterwards, on my left-hand side, a volley of bullets came in, and about six bullets went between my legs, on both sides of my legs, and then one of them bounced off the ground and hit me in the arm, shot me in the arm. That's the scar, yeah. The next thing I know, the machine gun's over there, and I'm back here, and I and like eight feet away from the machine gun, and uh, I didn't know how I got that far away from the machine gun from a gunshot wound, but it blew me back about eight feet. I said, I'm hit. Even when you're, all the battles that I've been through and everything and death is all around you, when you actually get shot, it surprises you. And I was surprised and I said I was hit. And I picked up the machine gun and I continued firing until I ran out of ammunition. We're all afraid of dying, I'm sure he was too. That was not the, the, the highest motivation for him. Highest motivation was to to do what was required. And he got right up there to the front and stayed there for two hours laying down a, uh, a good base of fire to keep the enemy down. Got shot through the arm, knocked back away from the gun, came back to the gun, continued the fight. Uh, M16 appeared next to me, like it was just right there in front of me with a with a bandolier of ammunition, with the, you know, with the clips in it. And it's the first time I saw it. So I picked it up and uh, I sat there and waited. I was not uh, told to withdraw yet, and I uh, heard noises in front of me. 
and I sat there and I, I waited as long as I could possibly wait and I thought the noise was right on top of me. And when that happened, I opened up with the M16 with the whole clip and everything got quiet. The noises weren't there anymore. Then I tried to reload with, and this arm was stiff and it couldn't move anymore and I was in pain. And I pulled out a clip and I dropped this clip out of the M16 and I used my knee to put another clip in, pulled the thing back and I sat there and waited. Then they told us to pull back. The short round of artillery already came in and killed Ducker and, and wounded Lieutenant Jones. And they said pull back, so I pulled back. And as I was coming back, I saw Lieutenant Jones against a tree and he was white as a sheet and he was full of holes. And he looked like he was gonna die that day. And I stooped down and, and I said, how are you? Are you gonna be okay? And he said, don't worry about me. He says, how are the men? And I thought that was an extremely, uh, unselfish thing to say at that time. Several things I remember while I was propped up there against that tree. Uh, one was Jesse Salcedo's gun team came by. And I remember uh, one of his uh, guys got right in my face about that far away, just stared at my eyes, then saying anything, moved on. And I thought, well, you son of a gun, you just want to take a good look at me before I die. Jesse was concerned and he asked me you know, about how I was doing. I responded to that. The thing that, uh, that really moved me was the company commander's uh, RTO, uh, radio telephone operator, he was a big guy. And uh, he wanted to come to my platoon real bad. And he came by, and I had all this blood still coming out of my mouth, nose. And he had a, a, a green bandana-like that he wore around his, his neck. And there was no PX out there. We didn't have any supplies. You couldn't get resupplied with anything. So what few personal items you had were important to you. And he took it off. He wiped the blood off my mouth and nose and stuck it in my hand. And I really, uh, I thought, what a kind act. It really impressed me. You know, I really appreciated that for him to give that up. And so the, the couple guys real quick uh, chopped some sticks and somebody had a poncho and they made a litter. Uh, when I got to the battalion perimeter, there was all kinds of help. Uh, guys that, that were there ran over, got the litter. The guys looking down, one of them said, look, he's not breathing. And I wanted to say, I'm okay. I, mean, I, I could see and hear, but I couldn't speak. And I, fade, I was fading in and out. I remember when the helicopter came in, uh, one of the uh, big uh, black soldiers was standing there and uh, he took whatever he had, his, his shirt or whatever. He tried to shield me from all the debris from the helicopter coming in. And I thought to myself, how ironic this was, is just uh, a few minutes ago, people I didn't know were doing everything they could in this world to kill me. And here's people that I don't know doing everything they can to be kind to me and save my life. A uh, chopper came in. I guess I must have been the only casualty left because they put me on it by myself. It was not a medevac chopper. It was just a regular Huey. Pilot, co-pilot, two door gunners. And I might as well have been a carton of sea rations. I mean, they were not medics. They ignored me. They did their job. They flew the helicopter and the door gunners looked out the doors. I just laid there. I remember after working on Lieutenant Jones and, and finding Kenny Byes that day, it just tore me up. It just tore my heart out because he had a complete evisceration. He'd been shot once in the stomach that I remember, and his intestines were on the outside of his, his uh, abdomen. And I knew he was dead, and I knew there was, there was not anything I could do for him. And um, I took it very hard. And. Um, I was really angry. I did something stupid. They go back to old recon, very close. When they brought Bies back and he was dead, he'd been gut shot. Doc Speed had uh, grabbed his weapon and tried to run forward, and somebody had to pull him down, keep him down. And then the next thing I knew, uh, they brought Kenny Bies's uh, body back from the ridge, down from the ridge. And I remember being at Kenny's side and um, 
And it was kind of just all over with for me at that point. You know, I wasn't injured, but seeing Kenny dead, then it was, to me, it was all over with. I uh, reached in his, his uh, fatigue pocket where he kept that silver spoon, and I pulled the silver spoon out and I stuck it in my pocket. Charlie was the only one that made it, and I was the only other one. I was gone, but now there's two left. Chuck Spencer, he would do anything that was required. He dug the holes, he, if he had guard duty, he'd be awake, uh, anything he had to do. After surviving a whole year in Vietnam, got back to the stateside, and he volunteered and went back for another year. Now that speaks for itself. Um, March 3rd, he didn't go up the hill with us. He stayed back to dig the holes. That day, I don't know why, but it, it, it was my turn. That's one of the guys who was left back in that area to dig holes, and the platoon got ate up. All I got to see was the results later. I got off the chopper, and I was walking through the compound, and I run in uh, to uh, one of the guys I know, and he says, well, he says, I, I better tell you, uh, first squad didn't make it. First squad was gone. And if I had been on r and R, I would have went too. And I just lost it. I, I went back to the uh, barracks and I just lost it. I went ballistic. I tore up my bed. I, I broke windows, was fighting other guys. I couldn't get over it. It was such a shock to me, you know, that your whole squad is not there no more. They tied me up, and they locked me in, in uh, one of the supply rooms. And uh, they left me there for a while. The captain asked me how I felt and why I was feeling so much anger and bitterness. And then I told him about Kenny Byes and Ronald Ducker and Nockadale and the guys that I knew very well. I lost control even with my fellow soldiers. I was fighting them too. I just wanted to kill somebody because of my uh, love and camaraderie I had for these men. He says, what do you want to do? I says, put me on the first chopper send me back to the jungle. He put me back in the jungle the next day. <laughs> so I was pretty, I was ready, that's what I wanted to do. After March 3rd, well, my last 12 days in the field, we made contact 11 times. I knew I didn't have many left. I was getting short. So I wanted to get in all of my good before I went home. After March 3rd, I was never the same. That changed my whole life. pictures but a, a lot of these these guys I wouldn't remember I know them now Spencer and and Mink and Jones 
Marciano and Tomazzoli. Birch. Salcedo. As individuals, I do not remember them. But uh, I know I had contact with every one of those guys. I met some guy in the VFW who told me about this society of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and I said, no way. <laughs> you know, they forgot about us, man. They ain't, you know. I said, no, man, said, there's a bunch of us out there. This has been great. It's unreal. It's 33 years, and what is it, eight people? And there wasn't that many that I serve with that's left. And a lot of them were killed, yeah. It's not that it's not painful when we get together and it's not stressful when we start to remember some of these things. This is a stressful thing, and it's not a, you know, there's, there's a mixture of stress and, and uh, happiness at the same time. These things only happen once a year, so sometimes I'm very happy it only happens once a year. Because it takes me a year to get over it, you know, once I leave, once we leave each other, because then, then there's, a, there's periods of time that I don't want to talk to another Vietnam vet, you know. And there's times that I really feel like I need to talk to them, or they need to talk to me. Sometimes I call guys up and just say, I just need to hear your voice, man, I know you're alive. I used to always say I could count my friends on one hand, have fingers left over. I meant that. These guys, as I find them again, after all these years, I'm going to run out of fingers. I mean, I, I trust these guys with my life. I, I trust them with anything, anything I had. I could never have this relationship with somebody I met that wasn't over there with us because they didn't prove themselves the way these guys have. The people that come to these reunions are the people that you could rely on. They have nothing to be ashamed of of what they did over there. Everybody here is a, was a good soldier. We are like family. And it's a very special family. And not everybody's allowed into that type of family. And what you have to do to get into it, you really, if you had any sense, you wouldn't want to do. There's a thing called platoon loyalty. And you can call it platoon loyalty, but it's not platoon loyalty, it's platoon love, that's what it is. But back when you're 19 years old, you don't dare say you love another man. That's basically what it was. And uh, when we got in these engagements, that, that was the biggest motivation, was trying to help the guys you love. When a lot of fellas came back, they were looked upon as war criminals. Baby killers, people would spit on them. If you told them you found a long range reconnaissance patrol tied to a trees and skinned alive by the North Vietnamese, they wouldn't believe it. It was a, it was a female, probably 20 years old, probably a college kid, spit on my uniform. There must have been 20, 30 protesters at the airport. And one of them spit on me and called me a baby killer. I expected to come home and just fit in, and it didn't happen. That's the last thing I was expecting was to be called a baby killer. I don't believe the Vietnam War was a wrong war. But I, what I do believe is that the way they treated the veteran when they came back was a wrong thing to do. You need to support the people that, that are fighting for your country. Think about this, you know, the Kent State University when four students were killed by the National Guard. The, the people uh, raised so much commotion about those four students. At that time, there were a thousand Americans, young Americans that were dying every week in Vietnam during the same time. Young boys that didn't know any better, don't know about the politics, don't even know why they were there sometimes. And who mourned for them? And who wrote them a song? Nothing you're not going to do for the next guy over. 
There's nothing he's not going to do for you. You don't have to know him. You don't have to know his name. You don't have to have ever seen him before. All you know is he's got an American uniform on. And uh, if it puts you in a situation that you might die in, you know, um, that's, that's your job. If you don't do your job, everybody's gonna die. I was a soldier, and that was my job to kill the enemy. I wasn't a cook or a driver. I was put in the jungle to kill the enemy. I took that with the perspective of doing what I had to do. That was my job. War taught me about death. We live in a, a body, the real us is a, is a soul that lives in a body. The body comes and goes. Everybody dies. Nobody gets out of this world alive. Some die sooner, some die later. I have no remorse for killing the enemy in, in Vietnam, none whatsoever. It was, um, it was my duty. When they started killing my friends, then it became more like vengeance because they took my friends away. It became personal after a while. The most important thing in my life was to went to Vietnam and to be with these men, the ones that died, the ones that are here. They didn't die in vain. They died for us. They died for Jesse Salcedo. They died for me. That's not in vain. You say they died for uh, Lyndon Johnson. They died for American flag. You're cheapening it. They died for the greatest thing you can die for, someone else. These guys are laying down their lives for, for the other men. The only reason we're putting Kenny Byes, Ronald Ducker, Donald Lapman, Donald Knockadale, Frank Brown, Harold Holmes, Tommy May, Merchant, on a pedestal because the law of physics, they, they, two things can occupy the same space at one time. They took a bolt into a vital organ, shrapnel of the vital organ, you know. And uh, even though they're gone, they experienced this. So I don't think their life was in vain. They experienced the same love, the same experiences that we had. They didn't miss out on that. They didn't get to experience life afterwards. But to be honest with you, life afterwards is nothing compared to the life we had there. One seventy third Airborne Brigade. One seventy third Airborne. One seventy third Airborne. One seventy third Airborne. One seventy third of the herd. The one seventy third. Right. Right. The herd was 
Talking about the 173rd. 